decrease the carbon uh, content in soils and above ground. Uh, in the afternoon, we then had uh, discussions with experts more from the economic uh, and political science side, where we discussed about all the different challenges institutionally to basically set up systems that allow us to incentivize in positive and uh, uh, other ways, uh, and also including the option, of course, of integrating carbon farming into carbon markets. But now, uh, in our final session, uh, Ingo and I would like to interview uh, the experts you see here in the front and uh, one in the chat. And I would like to quickly introduce our speakers and then give you a brief summary um, of the topics uh, we want to cover. So uh, first of all, I'm just going to down uh, my list. And uh, that's the order. You also saw them on the announcement. Um, Bernard Osterburg is uh, head of uh, the climate and soil departments at the Thun Institute. It's the Federal Research Institute for Rural Areas, Forests and Fisheries. Then we have uh, left of Bernhard on the table, at least from my side, uh, Sabine Frank. She's uh, the executive ex director at Carbon Market Watch since 2019. Um, and uh, we have uh, Dr. Ladislaw Marcinetto. Maybe you can wave your hand so we know who you are. He holds a doctorate degree in applied physics and he works uh, uh, at Embrapa, uh, Brazilian Agricultural Research Institute. Uh, then we have uh, Daniel Vargas from the Fundação Getúlio Vargas, uh, think tank, research think tank, um, and he has the coordinate the, the bioeconomy observatory at the foundation. We then have uh, Laura La Monica. Uh, she's uh, from the Brazilian Coalition on Climate, Forests, and Agriculture. And we have in Zoom uh, Eva or Lini Vornberg uh, from the Alliance of Biodiversity International in SEAT, um, based in, at the University of Vermont. Uh, we are very glad that all of you are here or at least participating over Zoom, and we look forward to our discussions. Uh, Ingo Melchers and I are going to do some ping pong with you. Um, but first of all, I'd like to remind everyone that this is part of uh, the agricultural policy dialogue between Brazil and Germany. So we are having a dialogue session. The colleague reminded us before um, we need to be empathic and uh, kind of understand the other. So, but we also want a bit of uh, an argument and a discussion here. So don't be too friendly to each other, but be friendly and diplomatic in the end. Um, and uh, maybe just by, by way of quickly summarizing uh, the discussions we, ha we had in the morning, we, we did uh, go through all the different discussions. And I think in the afternoon, we had uh, uh, then quite heated discussion about whether or not we should actually use carbon markets to uh, promote carbon farming. And uh, I would like to start uh, our discussion here by asking uh, Bernard Rutzerburg about, uh, yeah, there's some skepticism. We have sensed that, I think, uh, especially in the German academic debate about this idea of promoting carbon farming via carbon markets. Could you perhaps summarize for us uh, yeah, the most important concerns that you think um, are in the way of, of doing that? Yeah, thank you for this question. Um, uh, in, this, uh, in Germany, we discuss especially for um, carbon sequestration in mineral soils um, that uh, it's a complex issue to measure and monitor. They are measures um, uh, capable to, to increase soil carbon. Um, and they could be tracked um, by action-based uh, approach, but they have to be continued for a long uh, a time. So it's a, it's a question of continuity of, of schemes incentivizing um, this uh, kind of calm farming. Um, so a continuity or um, reversibility of the outcomes uh, really matter. Um, and also, who is in a very long term finally responsible? Who is finally the owner of this carbon? Um, is then still open question. Um, so it could be that uh, climate change will lead uh, to uh, soil carbon losses. Um, um, so that we have a, like a, a moving reference now and a shaky reference uh, level, um, which uh, will it make it really difficult um, to uh, quantify the add on. Uh, effects. Um, nevertheless, um, uh, we have to say um, that it's important to talk about soil uh, fertility. It has been said before um, that maintaining soil fertility via soil maintenance and increase 
uh, is very important for climate adaptation and maintaining um, soil productivity. Um, uh, so um, it, also the scientific community is not asked to be only skeptical, but to deliver solutions, um, how to make the best use uh, or how to incentivize what, what's needed. Um, uh, and that's not uh, too easy to have a good setting, which is um, honest, transparent, um, and acceptable for everyone. Bloom is positive for more than three Please mute your microphones uh, in Zoom. Uh, thank, thank you, Bernhard. Um, maybe just one more follow-up question. So, uh, of course, um, I think you nicely sketched the difficulties of uh, the carbon market itself. Um, but are there other ways? Uh, does it have to be the carbon market? And Given a role for the fund, funds of the agricultural policy would make sense in, in climate change issues, uh, which is still pending. If you really look um, from a more close um, point of view, uh, you can see that um, even what's planned by 2023, there will not be much changes in the um, common agriculture policy. Uh, there could be more clear and, and severe um, uh, incentives for agroforestry. I mean, agroforestry entered into the common agriculture policy, but more as an argument or on paper than really in the landscape. So how to get that into the landscape is a question of the, what we talked about, of, of the setting the incentives right. Yeah, And uh, from that point of view, also we have to say, uh, we, we check that soil organic carbon in mineral soils um, is the most difficult activity to monitor, to be monitored later. Um, uh, hedgerows, agroforestry and so on can be monitored by remote sensing and you can really set a reference. So that's easy. It's quite similar, um, although it's not um, increasing soil carbon, but avoiding emissions uh, for the peatland rewetting. Uh, it's quite territorial described um, um, uh, to be defined in, it, in territories where you change uh, water regime and land use, and that you can really good, uh, monitor in a much easier way. Um, and also to think about what incentives are needed um, to, to help uh, land users move into that direction. But let me one, uh, to, to add one, one thought. Um, I think we need more thinking in pricing in general, uh, because um, we have to think how to um, approach the, the very ambitious uh, climate policy goals in a cost efficient manner. We have to think about who pays for it and what does it cost. And uh, in the first instance, independent from the solution, what is the way to deliver? So there might be out there the idea that people emitting have to pay for and those um, sequestering carbon have to be paid for their services, for instance. If that's not delivered by the market, maybe the government could help out um, to, to put the right framework or incentives or compensations. Um, but the way to think about all that is quite helpful and think about what are the ways which are mo most cost, cost efficient. And when we have to start also, because um, waiting lots of time uh, also uh, incre is increasing the cost of adaptation we, we will need in, in all sectors and also of course in the land use sector. Thank you, Bernhard. Um, let's move to uh, Sabine Frank. Uh, Sabine, your organization, Carbon Market Watch, uh, you deal with with carbon, or you observe carbon markets across the whole spectrum of economic sectors. We have also in the morning discussed quite a bit about how the agricultural sector is different from, from the energy sector. Um, so uh, do you think carbon markets can actually become a sustainable source of finance for carbon, marking, mar um, for carbon farming? And if yes, 
um, how and if not, maybe what, what why. This one, yeah, sorry. Yeah. Um, yes, you asked the question, can carbon markets become um, a source of revenue to reward carbon farming? You could also ask, uh, should carbon markets become um, a source of revenue for carbon markets, uh, for, for carbon farming? Um, let's, um, yeah, let's take, let's take a, a, a step back first and, and look at, at uh, the climate challenge in the agricultural uh, sector. Um, globally speaking, and this is how policymakers have to look at it, no doubt farmers or agricultural interests would look at it different, differently. Generally speaking, from this global view, we have to state that um, the sequestration, the removal potential uh, in agriculture is only a small portion of the emissions of agriculture. Um, so that means that the removal potential that, that there is um, can only effectively compensate even only a portion of the emissions in the agricultural sector, let alone compensate for emissions beyond um, the agricultural sector for, uh, say, the compensations of the car industry or the compensations of the steel industry. And when, when we're talking about international carbon markets, we're talking about usually about trade beyond uh, beyond the sector that generates the credit. So in, the, in international carbon markets, agricultural credits would be on sale to players uh, from other sectors. Um, and there, uh, uh, a fundamental problem with that proposition is that you're potentially looking at compensating for emissions from fossil fuel um, combustion with uh, removals, biogenic uh, removals. And we would maintain that the two are simply uh, not comparable um, because of the length that um, carbon emissions from fossil fuel combustion stay in the atmosphere and the problem with the permanency of removals in the, in the agricultural sector. And that of all the criteria that have to be applied to carbon removals and to making, giving the credits that could be generated from them integrity, this is the most critical one. The principles that should apply to carbon crediting for, for removals are generally accepted. We know we need robust quantification measures. We know we need robust proof of additionality. That is the causal link between revenue generated and and the, um, and the activity that generates removals. We need uh, robust uh, permanence criteria and risk management systems uh, for lack of durability of carbon removals. We need uh, safeguards against other environmental uh, side effects and against social uh, side effects, et cetera. And most of them over time, you could say the improvements can be, can be achieved, say, on the robustness of quantification, science will advance. It's not that advanced uh, yet, but science will, will advance. But the one, the one key issue that will remain is that of the lack of durability of carbon removals, which make them not suitable for compensating for emissions. And the international carbon market is essentially it has traditionally been an offset market. And that's the problem. If we could move to a system whereby the international carbon market is no longer an offset market, but a market um, through which companies can make climate uh, contributions, can support, say, the efforts of developing countries in uh, reducing their emissions or offsetting their, their emissions, then that would be okay. But the way the scenario as it is with not just countries, but also companies having adopted net zero aims and that always net zero goals and that always removes, uh, always involves uh, removals as well to, uh, to compensate for unabatable emissions, uh, that remains problematical. Thank you. Would you, would you make, uh, is, is that a general argument um, or would you make a difference between uh, tropical agriculture or temperate region agriculture? or let's say land use change in general? The fundamental problem that I have, that I have outlined um, is the same. 
uh, there might be some difference in the the governance capabilities for some of the other criteria than the than the permanence uh, criterion. Um, but in principle, I think the, the the issues are the same. Thank you. Um, so we'd like to dig deeper into that um, and uh, talk a bit about uh, the measurement challenges, uh, but also the legal challenges. But for that, I hand over to my co-moderator, Ingo Melchers. Thank you, Jan. Uh, my name is Ingo Melchers. I'm heading the agricultural policy dialogue between Brazil and Germany. It's a pleasure to have you all here. Uh, good afternoon uh, to the ones who are assisting here in Germany. And it's lunchtime now in Brazil. So sorry for that. Uh, my first question goes to Professor Ladislao Martin Neto. Uh, from Embrapa, he has already been uh, presented. And uh, I would like to know, Ladislao, uh, from the Brazilian perspective, we have been discussing here the whole day, and uh, uh, to be honest, the whole week already. From the Brazilian perspective uh, on carbon farming, what are the potentials also for commercial, commercial uh, agriculture? What possibly are the knowledge gaps and uh, what are your scientific findings and conclusions so far? That is low. Thank you very much. Good afternoon for everybody. Thank you, Ingo. Uh, really, uh, uh, in the case of Brazil, uh, I believe that you have uh, a kind of a paradigm change in recent years and uh, with the possibility to increase production, to increase productivity, and conciliate this with the sustainability in agriculture. You have some practices that uh, helps a lot the governance of farmers. For example, no-till is uh, currently used in more than 35 million of hectare that you have reduced erosion. You have mm -hmm. possibility to improve uh, uh, soil aggregation, to improve uh, soil fertility, to water cap holding capacity and the other factors that are in beneficial of agronomic productivity and also to have carbon sequestration. Just an example, mainly in our savanna region, that is some things specific, you have this possibility for long, even more than in native vegetation area, because you have some constraint as soil acidity, uh, aluminum toxicity, low natural fertility. When you improve with good management practice, uh, with lime, with fertilization, you are able to change this situation and to have a much more productive and more sustainable with including soil carbon sequestration. This is one example, we have several others. And one of them that's not related with soil is the bio inputs, the biologic nitrogen fixation, for example, for soybean, you have around, again, 30 million of hectares without use of nitrogen fertilizer to, to soybean, that is a leguminous. This is in place for many years. This is, again, avoid the use of uh, fossil fuel uh, in the nitro nitrogen pro production, avoid any two formation. Then it's clearly a way to uh, to have this conciliation of production, productivity, and sustainability. Uh, and naturally, you must make measurement to make evaluation to have what you call MRV in good position in a convenient price. And for our research, you have invested recently in this development of a new tools, instead conventional ones to carbon uh, quantification, one of them laser-based called laser-induced breaking down spectroscopy soil carbon quantification, low, low price, and to go to make possible possible to scale up to the level of uh, private farms. You have currently in place a, a project in cooperation with Bayer going to until 2,000 uh, practically farms in different parts of Brazil. Thank you, Ladislao. Uh, let me permit me a, a follow-up question. Uh, you mentioned no tillage. Yeah, that is uh, uh, 
that's an issue for, for, for us, for the agriculture policy dialogue, because it's controversial. In uh, Germany, we have, we have seen uh, a lot of, uh, I, I, I would say more than skepticism, it's uh, criticism. And uh, uh, we have heard here about uh, today about no tillage. Uh, you mentioned 35 million hectares. What uh, uh, what what you say? How much uh, how much no tillage in, in uh, according to your research uh, would uh, uh, would be able to remove from uh, uh, carbon uh, atmospheric carbon? Yes, uh, this is a, a, a important point. Uh, generally, our data has shown that at least uh, one ton CO two equivalent per hectare is possible to have. In these uh, in several places uh, using no till. Naturally, as you know, Brazil is a kind of continent. You have different biomes, subtropical in the salt, uh, the savanna area, Atlantic forest. Uh, this is, you must see it, the soil condition, the kind of uh, uh, practice, uh, more detail, co cover, pro cover crops or not. It, it, Enter more recently disintegration crop livestock crop livestock forests that is increase more possibilities to to this uh, carbon uh, sequestration including the trees but even with using the, some kind of pasture land as bracket area they are so efficient to photosynthesis a C4 uh, plant then this date can reach to easily to five uh, tons of CO2 equivalent that is really important number considering also for example integrate production system mainly crop livestock but also parts crop livestock forest is reaching uh, 70 million of hectares under this integrated system then uh, for our perception for our view uh, this is really a condition that address carbon market and carbon sequestration thank you thank you very much uh, my next question will, will go to, to Daniel Vargas, uh, who is uh, a coordinator of the Bioeconomy Bio Observatory uh, from the uh, FGV Fundação Getúlio Vargas. Uh, Daniel, or Daniel, uh, to include tropical agriculture and livestock into the carbon markets may not be the fast selling item some may have expected. Uh, as we heard here in, uh, during the day. But let us understand better what are the current movements in the regulated markets and the private carbon markets and how do they communicate with each other? Uh, thanks, Ingo. It's a long and complex question. Let me see if I can unpack it and address parts of it at least. So I always like to look at the carbon market as a very special and particular kind of market. We normally look at markets in the way that we think about food, for example. I wake up, I am hungry, I go to the market and I wanna buy some fruits to satisfy my demand. Or I uh, want to drink something and then I look for something that satisfies my body needs, uh, my thirst. But when we talk about carbon, that doesn't usually take place. No one wakes up hungry to buy some carbon. No one goes to a store to buy a carbon juice. So where does the demand come from? It comes from a political pact set by diplomacy or by law. And as we establish that demand, artificially creating an idea of property, which we associate with a right to emit or to reduce emissions, then is when we trigger the demand for some kinds of action which will lead to the formation of a market. Those companies or those institutions that are unable to reach that commitment set by the law, by the pact, will need to look for credits to satisfy their own demand. So that's how it starts. And why I think that is important? Because it's, for me, always imperfect or insufficient to say that there is a carbon market. There are rules that structure the carbon market. And depending on how we set these rules, we are also deciding what kind of market we want to establish and to exist. So if you establish a set of rules that says, oil companies will have a demand and they will be able to buy credits 
in the cases in which they're unable to reach their commitments, then you decided by a political pact to create a property, the right to emit, to create a demand for credits and to create a supply, supply of credits for oil companies. But if that is true for oil companies, that would also be true for other areas. And the question therefore is to which extent we should, it would be desirable today, considering the circumstances of countries, their levels of emissions, the particularities of their pollution, in to which extent would it be desirable to tailor or to uh, uh, reorganize, rethink carbon systems so that we could actually create demands and supplies of carbon credits for economic activities that prevail in those countries? And now I come to your question. What are the key regulatory or private questions or, or, or private market uh, initiatives that seem to be especially relevant right now vis-a-vis um, -vis carbon farming? So in my view, I think there are three questions that I'd like to pinpoint very quickly. First of all, since Glasgow, every country has now to regulate their own structure of the market transactions. So we see all over the world, parliaments setting laws to regulate their markets. A question here is to which extent this cap will include or not include food production. In countries like Brazil, that is under debate, but I would say that there is a tendency to include agricultural production within the uh, cap, within the commitments that will in the end sum up to review our NDCs, our national commitments. So that's the first question. The second question is, to which extent and how are you going to regulate the actors that play in this market? So many places around the world, especially in the developing world, this carbon market is still uh, uh, organized and played by very few players. Uh, in general, and I think that is the case in Brazil, many of them come from abroad and they are charging dollars and it is very expensive to participate in that market. And as a result, due to the concentration and the price, very few people are able to participate on it. So you create a fat au compli. You know, of course, there's a very little market because also it's very hard to enter into the market. Again, how do you change that? How do you open that? How do you stimulate competition? You regulate it in a different way. Finally, the private market. We also see going on at a relatively high speed, I would say in Brazil and other countries, uh, some level of experimentation with the development of uh, business models, technologies, but also methodologies that could actually open the gates of different kinds of production for market transactions to take place. Uh, usually that first takes place in the private sector. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. There is a level of uncertainty that I think is also part of that game. But to some extent, if you read it in an optimistic way, it's also the embryo, a set of lessons that could in a second stage be incorporated in a, in a kind of regulated market in the future. Thank you. Just uh, uh, for you too, another follow-up question. There are some, uh, some skepticism as already mentioned, uh, and uh, we have learned a lot today. What would be your, your, your preliminary answer to these, uh, to these issues we, we have discussed and you have certainly read about. So uh, I have two comments on that issue. The first is this, uh, as far as I understand how the governance system of market transactions work and the beauty of it is that we are organizing a system in which you set threshold for different organizations and countries. And what you expect them is to move beyond that. And as you are successful moving beyond that threshold, moving beyond that commitment, you're able to exchange the credits for someone else. Um, why I'm saying that, think of the oil market. So a Norwegian oil company improves the technology to extract oil by doing that, reduce the emission of methane and oil, it's still oil and it's still very pollutant, and obviously it emits a lot of CO2. But by improving that technology and therefore reducing the level of emissions that the company has, it is allowed to sell credits. So if an agricultural producer in Brazil or in Argentina is able to improve the techniques according to which it produces, and by doing that to reduce the relative terms of emissions of its activity, then I also think by analogy, it should be allowed to sell carbon credits. But I, 
I understand and, and I know that are critical scientific issues that need to be properly addressed and improved over time. What I don't understand is to look at the problem as a problem of absolute terms. So when we're talking about Paris and the path towards decarbonization, we're not talking about zero emissions. We're talking about net zero emissions. So it's about uh, reducing more than emitting. And if you are able over time to cut your emissions, then it seems to me it would be more than understandable that you're also able to engage in the market in a positive way, in the very same way as it currently works with the energy sector. So I will stop there because I know my, my response was a bit long. Thank you. Uh, I come now to Laura, Laura La Monica. Uh, let me uh, uh, present again uh, Laura La Monica. She is representing the uh, Brazil Coalition on Climate, Forests and Agriculture. And that's uh, uh, for, for, for the German, uh, uh, for the German audience, somehow a curious creature. Uh, because it's, uh, it's going from uh, uh, private banks, uh, uh, enterprises, uh, 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 science, a lot of science organizations, a lot of emprendedores, entrepreneurs, associations, and, uh, and of course, NGOs, renowned, internationally renowned uh, NGOs. And so you're representing this, uh, this uh, interesting creature uh, here in uh, uh, your executive or coordinator. I would like to know from you what must happen for Brazil to become an important player in carbon farming and what differences between large and family farms will you see and what must be taken into account? Thank you very much, Ingo. Thank you for the invitation and for this introduction. I'm very glad to be here. I feel like a small student among these experts here. So <laughs> thank you for having me. Um, well, the, the coalition uh, believes that Brazil has all the conditions to become this important player in carbon farming. And to do so, it's important for us to uh, implement and to scale up our low carbon practices, as um, many of them were mentioned here before. Uh, so to do that um, for small and family farmers, for example, we really need to structure a really good technical assistance uh, system or programs, because uh, these people don't have uh, usually the, um, uh, the money to do that. So they need uh, technical assistance uh, programs to improve and these technical system programs has to be focused on low carbon practices. And um, at the same time, uh, because for example, just giving an example here, uh, low technology livestock usually uh, impacts um, small farmers and family farmers and uh, it jeopardizes their productivity year after year, jeopardizing incomes, jeopardizing their li livelihoods. And at the same time, we have a large area of degraded areas, uh, degraded pastures in Brazil, where um, we don't have uh, not we don't have only the potential to uh, get benefits from carbon markets of this of, of recovering these areas, but also we can, uh, for example, by a good technical assistance program. And uh, we can have an um, agroforestry system uh, growing up in these degraded areas uh, by small and family farmers. So it's good uh, for carbon markets. It's good also to uh, reduce pressure to deforest new areas once we have uh, already these ones. And besides technical assistance, uh, it's uh, crucial as well to have <coughs> for family and small farmers, uh, easy access to rural credit and all the, um, specific lines of credit. I think this is the point. Investments is uh, the core difference between large and small farmers and in Brazil or anywhere, uh, because that's it. So small farmers need uh, this uh, easy access to credit and large farmers need to uh, invest 
most part of the, their money in low carbon practices and uh, increasing productivity. So I think that's it. And um, it's possible uh, to show this way from uh, large farmers that can improve their productivity and um, by this low carbon practice that it is possible to produce more and to produce better without deforestation in Brazil, something that the Brazilian coalition has uh, been uh, defending in a lot of ways. And finally, I promise <laughs> I'm gonna end. Um, we have in Brazil a national plan to low carbon uh, agriculture as mentioned before by Camila here. Uh, it's called the ABC plus plan. So it's important as well to implement this plan and um, it includes it's, it's strengthening uh, science and technological development. So it's important to consider too. So summarizing technical assistance and easy credit uh, to small and uh, family farmers and um, investments and uh, focused on low carbon practices and uh, increasing productivity for large farmers. <laughs> Thank you, Laura. Uh, for, for you too, a follow-up question shortly, very shortly. Uh, I imagine that uh, the opinion building processes in, in, uh, in, the, in that broad alliance of the coalition Brazil uh, are not that easy always. Uh, uh, is there any uh, uh, consent uh, opinion on carbon farming uh, within the coalition? Yeah, we, we have been building like a consensus about carbon markets as a whole. And uh, because we have in Brazil more than 70% of our emissions coming from land use change, especially deforestation and agricultural practices, uh, the coalition defends that these activities, land use, has to be considered in some way in carbon markets. And uh, what is important to mention here is that um, carbon markets can't... Uh, come alone. So this instrument has to be combined with other policies and other measures that helps Brazil to uh, reduce deforestation to end illegal deforestation, for example, that uh, represents more than 90% of the deforestation happening in Brazil right now. And uh, also instruments for forest valuation. So I think carbon markets, and this is uh, what uh, coalition have been working on, uh, has to be part of a bigger strategy, a bigger strategy that considers this uh, decarbonization and to um, replace Brazil in this climate discussion. Thank you very much, Laura. I would like to hand over to my friend and colleague, Jan. Okay, now it seems to work. It's much better to sit in front of the panel than standing behind the panel. So I'm gonna stay here. Uh, we have talked a lot about uh, Brazilian and German perspectives uh, today, and uh, that's why we have invited uh, Eva Lini Wornberg uh, to give us a more global perspective. Uh, Lini, you have been working on, on agroecological services, including uh, carbon, um, with a global perspective for many years. Um, and uh, in some of our discussions this morning, we have also talked a little bit about potential trade-offs that might occur when we have a market-based mechanism that only focuses on carbon. Um, so uh, could you maybe tell us a bit about um, how worried you are about that kind of uh, issues um, when it comes to a discussion about including carbon farming in carbon markets? Thank you, Jan. And thank you everyone for the excellent discussion so far. Uh, I'm not concerned about trade-offs as long as we can ensure that the carbon market is rewarding productive, sustainable agriculture and also accounting for the risks that farmers might, may face. So I think there are three main types of trade-offs to be concerned about. The first is land use change. Uh, in the case of forestry and agriculture, we have a price differential, um, or I should say a value differential in that forestry land has much higher carbon value than most agricultural land. And so uh, we see, for example, in New Zealand, uh, because forest carbon credits are available and uh, sheep methane would be uh, taxed essentially through a carbon fee, we see sheep farmers converting land to uh, more forest land. 
So that raises concerns, you know, not only economically, but potentially for food security, especially when you're talking about uh, low income countries. Um, the second, I think, uh, more abiding fear has been that um, in the case of forest carbon, um, that you would be locking up land uh, that would prevent expansion of agricultural land. And again, that will be most important in, in countries where intensification and, and input supplies are, are not as possible. Um, and not necessarily in, in some parts of Brazil. The second major trade-off would be in uh, the case of sustainable uh, agricultural practices. So uh, I heard the mention of conservation agriculture, which of course is, is a major practice in, in Brazil. Brazil's probably been the leader in that regard. And uh, the potential trade-off is in increased pesticide use. And so you know, we need to think about you know, impacts on human health, on soil quality and soil health and water quality that may uh, result from new practices or, or intensification of some practices. And then also to consider that enhancing soil carbon usually requires increased inputs of some sort and agriculture generally requires in many parts of the world uh, increased fertilizer and, and to be sustained will require probably combinations of organic fertilizers and uh, biological nitrogen fixation and so on. And so to be able to um, maintain uh, fertilizer inputs over time will increase emissions as well. The third main trade-off very quickly is uh, farmer risk. Um, for example, agroforestry has been one of the most um, common practices in the carbon market. And to first of all, to plant trees um, may lock up land in practices that farmers um, may not want to do if prices change or if land titles change. Um, but also to um, assure farmers, and, and I think Sabina touched on this, of you know, the, the uh, returns in the carbon market. So carbon markets have been somewhat volatile, especially over the last 20 years. Um, how can we ensure that farmers will get the benefits that they expect? How can we ensure that farmers can deliver the emissions that they want? And, and the market has been quite good in, in developing some discounting and risk management mechanisms in that regard. So as long as we can manage uh, the sustainability, the um, land use change and landscape mosaic, and the uh, risks to farmers, I, I feel confident it can work. Thank you. Uh, you already gave us some examples from New Zealand. Um, are there, and I think we talked about sort of how it could be done. Brazil is setting up a, a national carbon trading system. Um, Europe has one. Uh, are there any sort of good practice examples that you could um, point us to that uh, where, you, where you would say, well, they managed to actually combine the three conditions you just mentioned, or at least um, we can learn from them in terms of how to set this up in such a way that it actually leads to uh, emission reductions um, as opposed to greenwashing and all the other potential criticisms that could there be. Yeah, I think there've been two overall examples. One is Alberta, Canada, and the other one is the Kenya Agro uh, what is it, uh, Kenya Agricultural Carbon Project, KACP, uh, that was run by V Agroforestry and, and the World Bank. But I want to really focus on the features rather than the projects, because any one project can be critiqued from, you know, from a number of examples. So the key features have been, I would say, bundling, um, some combination of technology transfer and infrastructure, to providing the finance that's been me mentioned, especially finance in advance and, and blended public-private finance. Three is low cost MRV, and especially not creating a burden for the farmer in, in the MRV. And then four is, and I think this is really important and often forgotten, is the policy support uh, in that it, it, it's very important that national policy is also driving these practices. Um, maybe a, a final point overall is that we, you know, the carbon market cannot be the single driver of the practice. Then, then we're gonna see perverse incentives. I think that the, the fundamental principle is that the practice has to be providing benefits both to the farmer and to the public at a level um, be, regardless of the carbon market. Um, so that's one point. Second is aggregation models. Uh, we know that aggreg aggregating, especially smallholders, can uh, reduce costs, but also statistically in any 
for example, geographic area, you will have some farmers who don't perform. And if you have a, either a regional or jurisdictional model, you can allow for some farmers to perform well and some farmers not to perform well by having aggregation models and also economies of scale will, will reduce costs. And the third point is um, benefit sharing. We know that um, there's been high potential and demonstrated corruption and also conflict among community members. And so having strong benefit sharing mechanisms that are transparent and build on existing community uh, conflict management structures um, is, is extremely important. Um, yeah, I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you. That, that, that sounds, there's hope at least. That's great. Um, uh, we want to open up for question. I'm already seeing one in the chat, but before that, I would like to um, offer our panelists to maybe react to each other. Is there anyone who'd like to, to start and maybe take up some of the arguments? Yeah, please go ahead. Uh, yeah, thank you, Lini. I, I like your idea of um, benefit sharing. That's quite important because in Germany we have this problem of drained peatlands, and we are like stuck in a in an old land use idea to to colonize and make agricultural use of of any land, and that's not really sustainable. But how to get out of that? And now we we think we want to expand um, photovoltaic. Um, uh, facilities and maybe we could uh, use um, this land totally revetted um, and and put um, uh, uh, photovoltaic um, facilities on it that would create huge um, returns uh, sufficient to to um, turn more land into a better situation but for that you would need uh, benefit sharing models and good contracts and even the legal part could hamper any movement there so maybe we will have a situation where we put uh, photovoltaic facilities on the best soils, arable soils and so on, leaving peatland as it is. Um, so uh, that's just a comment more now that we are thinking about. That's something like not really pricing directly, but using the transformations ahead um, to, to have um, double win situations. But, but how to get there? Thank you. Yeah, if I could respond. So one uh, one way of addressing that is uh, aggregated uh, benefits. In other words, community level benefits in the form of either public goods or services to the community, and and that has been demonstrated to reduce conflict. How oh, it works. So. Uh, it seems there are other models as well. Um, maybe we can explore that further. But first of all, are there other reactions from the panel? Yes, please go ahead. Perhaps it's a semi-response to the person next to me. Um, I'd like to come back to the question of how to incentivize uh, carbon farming practices, if we all agree, assume that in principle this is, um, is a good thing. In the European Union, we have the principle enshrined in our treaties that the polluter should pay. The polluter pays. It's a universal principle. It's it's um, applied in a very limited form uh, at the moment in the European emissions trading system. We apply a price to uh, energy pro electricity providers and to heavy industry, uh, steel, cement, paper, pulp, aluminium, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. We're in the process of expanding that. Um, it's a it's a difficult political. Uh, debate, get more industrial sectors in it, expand it. We are now on the verge of expanding it to, sh to the shipping sector, to the transport sector, to the building sector. Agriculture is also down the line, but it's not. we're not socially and therefore not politically ready to expand it to agriculture, although there is a general promise that by 35 there would be a price um, on agriculture. So if, and, and carbon pricing is basic, if you are, if you are penalizing polluting practices, you're indirectly um, promoting beneficial practices, or you're giving them an economic space to develop. Um, but if we can't have that for agriculture, then we have to ask, where else does the incentive come from? Uh, one obvious way of incenting it, incentivizing it is um, via public subsidies. But again, where the European Union is concerned, although the common agricultural policy is primarily a subsidies a policy. The window of opportunity at the moment is closed for incentivizing uh, carbon farming through subsidies. So, okay, what do we look to next? We look to, we look to international uh, carbon markets. 
And what's the situation in international carbon markets? First of all, soil carbon sequestration projects are still a very, very small share at the moment of that, of that market. The land-based um, share of the voluntary carbon market is fairly sizable, but it's currently characterized by a large oversupply compared to demand. So anybody who puts their hope in that market has to has to consider that uh, the 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 um, creation of projects and the issuance of credits has over the years outstripped uh, the demand, and um, that has an effect on price. We are still seeing at the height of COP. COP in Glasgow, the price was, I think, $6.8 uh, for a, land, uh, a credit from the land sector. So uh, that's uh, yeah, not, a, not a good price, especially if you want to have very demanding um, uh, MRV uh, applied uh, to projects. Um, um, the the overall problem is that this market has a problem with quality. The low price, the 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 imbalance between demand and supply, and the low price is an expression of the of the quality problem that this that this market has. And um, take the the car, the soil sequestration project the protocols that we have in the market. They're about. 14, uh, I think, amongst the big four registries, none of them have stood the test of independent academic scrutiny. So there is a lot to improve. Carbon Plan, for example, who has examined that ends their, ends their uh, assessment of these protocols with the recommendation to buyers that they should look very specifically at the project from which they buy credits. They shouldn't just rely on you know, the hallmark of the registry uh, that is attached to it, but ask very specific questions about the project that has generated the credits. Now, big players can do that. They, they, they have the resources maybe to go into scrutinizing projects, but for most companies that look to buy carbon credits, they can't be expected to do that. So we need international governance efforts for the for the carbon markets, and they are there. Perhaps you've heard of the Mark Carney uh, Task Force for Scaling Up Voluntary Carbon Markets. It was this big idea the voluntary carbon market could grow 13-fold. Um, but very soon, the question became, well, if, it, if the carbon market is supposed to be bigger, then we need more integrity in that market. We need higher quality credits. And what we, what we have at the moment is two major initiatives. One to govern, to regulate the supply side with the Integrity Council for the Voluntary Carbon Market, which is a big, big consultation exercise, which will sometime this year um, come out with its core carbon principle and its assessment framework, which will go in the direction of actually giving a sort of quality label for credits that are generated. And on the other hand, a governance effort that relates to the claims that companies that buy the credits um, can make with the, the um, voluntary carbon market integrity uh, in, in initiative. So everybody who looks uh, to, the, to the international carbon uh, market and uh, creating revenue streams for carbon farming is well advised to, to look at these initiatives underway and to take, take clues from them for the, uh, the quality that has to be assured by supplying um, carbon markets with credits from carbon farming. Um, I would like to, to make another question on, on uh, the difference between tropical soils and tropical uh, regions and uh, temperate uh, agriculture. Uh, we have seen that uh, the tropical soils are generally very poor. And so the, the potential to increase and to uh, remove atmospheric carbon is especially high. And uh, I would like to know, and, and we have seen that uh, not only from Embrapa, but other uh, 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 academic institutions, there is some, uh, there's very solid scientific uh, knowledge about uh, the potential of removal of carbon that is uh, 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 in, uh, Higher than in temperate climate, and so I'm. I'm question. I'm, my question is goes not only uh, to Brazil but to the whole tropical area, uh, looking to Africa too. So, uh, uh, Ladis, perhaps Ladislao, you you might answer that. What uh, what uh, uh, what are you thinking about uh, that differences? And looking also to the metrics 
that has been uh, uh, discussed and elaborated mainly uh, 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 looking at the temperate uh, agriculture. Thank you, Ingo. Uh, really is uh, the difference. Uh, the first one is uh, at least in some region of a warmer, warmer climate, you can have more than one crop per year, uh, two or three. And this uh, is generating a high amount of biomass that part dependent of the coefficient, humification coefficient can remain in the soil. And uh, going in long term, this can go down and then considering also the characteristic of soil, these uh, oxy soils that are very deep soil, you can accumulate down this uh, soil organic matter. And this means that it probably is more protected, protected. And then believe, you believe that it can have a higher lifetime in soil that is some of risk of this uh, leakage. Uh, this, this is a first uh, a point, but uh, uh, there are others that is, is how this is being adopted. And in our country is growing adoption of this practice that permits uh, to, 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 to expand in large areas the, this condition. In temperate region, uh, including recent, uh, recent publication is a metadata analysis, it make what you asked for me, the comparison with uh, temperate and warmer uh, <coughs> tropical climates. And this is a study from uh, authors, uh, it's a colleague from us from Embrapa, is an, Rodrigo Nicoloso from Embrapa, and uh, Charles Rice from Kansas State University. And this is a, actually a metadata analysis. What uh, from 120 sites, 19 countries, six continents, and make this comparison. One of conclusion confirm this trend, not only with data from Brazil, from other regions as well. And naturally, our colleagues from here, from temperate region, can interpret this, uh, what is the difference. But this is a, a, a paradigm change, because in the past, using conventional tillage, you are considered a net emissor, uh, because you had a high temperature, high humidity, high microbial activity, no soil protection for, for the carbon compound, generally you increase a lot emission. But this changed, at least in Brazil, a lot, like uh, you mentioned before, and in other regions as well. But the difference, naturally, in the temperate area, just one crop season, you have a strong winter time, that is good to not to, 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 to have a generation of emission. But apparently, what we have seen, uh, I don't know if it's steady state conditions on the other condition, in, in temperate area and this new data, the new condition for tropical region is shown up. It's not the only a matter of uh, 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 clay content. I have seen studies that just looking for where you can have a higher soil carbon sequestration, where you have a higher, higher uh, soil texture. This is one important, but the biomass amount incorporation of this bio production net uh, Production productivity it is very critical. At least recent data are showing this. At least from my knowledge. Thank you. Yeah, we have uh, heard a lot about um, quality of credits, and I'm actually wondering whether we can bring together what you just said, Ladislaw, about there's a lot of science that is um, improving the measurement. There's a lot of science actually also looking into the effectiveness of carbon markets. Um, is can science help to improve? The quality of these credits and um, make this a safer bet than it currently seems or how do you see that um, i'd like to uh, announce with that question also the opening of the floor to our audiences both here in the room and in uh, in zoom so if you uh, want to ask a question after someone has maybe tried to answer mine um, please do so and we try to uh, uh, go through the different hands and have you ask questions. You can also use the chat, of course. Anyone willing to respond on the role of science to improve credibility of credits? 
May I just say a short, I just talked, sorry, my colleagues. Uh, there are one is soil carbon quantification is an important critical issue to soil carbon is, is stock. The other one is soil carbon stability, recalcitrance, and lifetime in soil. This certainly is missing tools. Uh, but you have you have not because of us, but it's, it's, it's published, it, it's a patent of Fabrapa. You develop also based laser bases and other uh, laser induced fluorescence that you are able to see a kind of fumification index of soil from whole soil sample without any fraction. And this is a possibility, it's not a number yet, it's not a, you can say it's 20 year, 30 year, but it's a difference. And this, as I told the accumulation depth, you can see this clearly this different as is spectral. Generally, the, the incorporation of recently transformed residues, organic residues, generally has this coefficient is lower. Going down, this coefficient is higher. Is, is, is a start certainly there are several other possibilities, but the idea is the combination to quantify well, low cost, and to know, to have an indication of stability. Just to my comment. Thanks. Sorry. Yeah. I, I would add the point that uh, in the EU, um, since uh, the Lulu CF sector is included into the climate targets, um, the expectation to to deliver. Um, more reliable um, uh, calculations for the national accounts of, of greenhouse gases is driving um, science and knowledge uh, a lot, but not on every plot, I have to tell, uh, but that sampling, sampling some sites and having a general picture where we, we are going, whether they are trends and so on. And it's a slow ongoing process because the, the differences you can detect uh, maybe 10 years later in, in um, mineral um, uh, crop soils, um, if there's a trend. Uh, if not, you are really in, 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 in the area term more or less. So um, that makes it a bit difficult um, to really uh, say that's a very quick um, um, advance or to be expected. Um, but I guess, yes, uh, we will, um, science will provide a lot of knowledge. And uh, in the long term, it might be a good idea to really um, combine adaptation and maintenance of soil fertility as an dri important driver as well in the self interest of, of land users um, with um, mitigation issues. Thanks. Plus, there's science on what works and what doesn't to incentivize farmers to uh, improve sustainability of agriculture. Daniel. So I just would like to add uh, two, quick, two quick comments <clears throat> on the role of science and the relationship between new and good science and the advance of this decarbonization agenda in general and the market in particular. So I do think that is a critical issue both for the capacity of developing countries to move ahead with their sustainability agendas, but also for the very credibility of the global system of governance of decarbonization. And the reason I'm saying that is because um, I think when we look at the most well-established methodologies and metrics, according to which we measure emissions and organize transactions, they uh, tend in general to have been developed over the last 20 years, basically in developed countries. And I would say that mostly in particular in Europe. And, and there's a reason for that. It's because until 2015, when the Paris Agreement was actually uh, set, the developed countries were part of that Annex One of the Kyoto Protocol and they were effectively the ones who were obliged to take actions to decarbonize. Mm -hmm. Developing countries could participate in it, but they were not uh, demanded to do so. So let's say uh, the, the pact, uh, the loss, the global pact created this agenda for the scientific advancement in development. Now it's working again. So a whole set of metrics, methodologies were actually developed to support those countries to reach those goals. 
in 2015, the structure changed. Now the whole world has actually committed itself to reducing emissions, but I do think we still have a gap, a scientific gap to make up for, and that requires more science, new and specific ways of measuring emissions in developing countries, and therefore to support them to reach their goals. So I would say that for developing countries, science is a, a critical issue to allow them to move forward. And I would say, this is my final point, I'll be very quick, is that when you connect that discussion with the market, then the connection is also quite natural. I mean, if you can't measure properly, if you're not sure exactly about your emissions and about your sequestrations, then how are you going to actually engage in a market in reasonably equal terms? You are not. So that's part of the legitimacy challenge that is actually posed, uh, but which has at its core this, this, this huge requirement to develop, uh, I would say a tropical science, but a global science uh, more quickly. Thanks, Daniel. I'm now gonna ask two questions that came up in the chat. And after that, I'm gonna look backwards into the room and see whether someone here in the room wants to ask a question. Uh, Yusuf uh, Karatay from Embrapa is asking uh, to Bernhard, do you see the inclusion of agriculture and compulsory uh, in brackets, regulated markets realistic in the mid long term? And would it be rather an opportunity or a threat, for example, considering food security? Uh, and the second question uh, is to the Brazilian panel participants. Uh, you spoke about carbon farming in relation to crop production, forestry and agroforestry. Do you see also potential of carbon farming for grasslands in Brazil? And that question is from Sonia Germa from ATB. Okay, um, hello Yusuf, um, thanks for your question and uh, I, I would say it, at the moment it's a more academic discussion uh, to fully include um, agriculture and maybe also agricultural land use and into a um, international or EU pricing systems. Um, that's not really on the agenda or the debate, it's a scientific debate. And it could be a proxy to understand better what uh, what are the costs of, of um, measures, for instance, as I, I tried to explain before. And I like that idea of thinking you now to to find the right ways and and to to have the discussion also on what does it cost, who pays for it. Um, when it comes to interventions into the agricultural um, production system, uh, also we have discussion, and that's real policy. Um, uh, what's going on with the livestock sector? Um, and there we could see, instead of pricing approaches, which could have similar um, effects, of course, um, that we will see maybe kinds of quota um, to curb down um, the amount of livestock and maybe increase um, uh, the, the efficiency in the livestock stock sector um, if we are happy enough to have the right instruments uh, on the way for that. And to be honest, um, that might increase um, food security um, at the global level, because um, uh, high livestock um, uh, amounts in Europe also consume lots of um, eatable food from humans, um, and uh, that's more for for the purchasing power um, of the uh, European citizens and their preferences in the food markets. Um, and if we now get a climate policy, we could see really big shifts, and not not always against food security. Um, when it comes up to uh, afforestation as a simple solution in the land use sector and quite detectable, you have your remote sensing going around every year or so, um, that could be a pay, paying um, instrument really consuming a valuable land and um, expropriating in a way, at, this, at least as a danger, um, poor population in maybe remote countries from the European point of view. And there, of course, um, uh, um, food security is at stake and we have to discuss that, how to put the limits, how to control those markets uh, to, to avoid such um, un, uh, unwanted, undesired uh, effects. Anyone from the Brazilian colleagues who wants to answer the question on grasslands? Yes, grassland for sure is an amazing opportunity. Brazil has around 180 million of hectares under pasture land, and the, something the number varies, but seven to nine million of pasture land in some stage that can be improved 
and and certainly this is considering the several published uh, papers uh, regarding this brachiaria with good uh, practice with lime mainly in savannah but in other region as well uh, there is a huge potential to soil carbon sequestration they have a very strong grow very strong c4 plant with a strong above above ground uh, biomass and also below ground with root until deep and recent data showing that around 40 to 50 percent of all incorporated carbon in soil comes from the root exudate that is so so important then for sure uh, pasture land is a very very important and include uh, the what is in the market is currently it's not only science the uh, a neutral carbon beef uh, that was mentioned here by eduardo uh, that you are selling this product and you have the certificate of how this occurring one of these compensation uh, is through the soil naturally if you have trees you have in the wood also that is easy to to audit so for sure this is a very very important condition for our country to improve this condition to soil carbon sequestration in pasture land okay thanks uh looking back into the room anyone who wants to ask a question of those of you you look all tired but you have been here for the whole day now. not seeing that anyone in zoom who wants to ask another question yeah there's Eva Sternfeld from DCZ please unmute yourself um, yes hello um, from Berlin and um, more maybe a comment because I yesterday participated in the so-called um, organic field days or Ökofeldtage in uh, near Limburg, and that's a big convention of organic farmers. And they had also a similar panel like today on the on the similar topic like um, um, carbon farming. And the panel among the panelists was also the uh, secretary, the parliamentary secretary Ophelia Nick. And um, I4M chairman um, from Europe, um, and he's also the chairman of Bioland. And as you mentioned, I think you mentioned it already, they are really skeptical about um, um, carbon farming. And um, Mr. Black, uh, the, the president of I4M, he said they will recommend their, their members not to participate in this at the moment because they think it's rather immature and they say uh, um, mrs um, nick she said maybe um, of course she supports this um, uh, good practices to improve the soil and to improve the capacity to store carbon but um, she she sees that um, at the moment there's a lot of people are yeah, there waiting just to make money or to do all these consulting companies. And um, um, so I don't know if you have discussed this already this morning, but um, I think at least in our government, in our new man ministry, there's a lot of skepticism in, uh, um, uh, about carbon farming. Okay, anyone wants to react to that comment? I think, uh, yeah. On, only some few words. Thank you very much to have uh, give you uh, give us uh, insights into this uh, uh, discussion, which is quite similar what we discussed um, over this day. Um, and indeed, it's our observation from Tuna Institute also that we have in, in Germany and, and in, in the EU so many startups entering normally coming from other um, uh, sectors in a way um, people not so close to agriculture trying to develop a business which could be a chance of course but also if um, 
this is failing um, participating farmers could lose a lot because um, we, we had for instance on a, a, a discussion um, beginning this year with the uh, German farmers union and um, this discussion was also about do we seek as a farmers community really money for a ton of carbon um, or uh, do we seek more acknowledgement for what we are doing and what we are caring for the soil and that was quite clear that the latter is very important and you could lose really credit points if you try to get money in a way and it's not really a reliable system um, and also it was recommended not to sell out uh, credits to any other sector like um, the um, transport sector for instance now with with uh, flights or so um, but uh, more to go for um, insetting like um, decarbonizing of food or showing what could be the pathway for a net zero food sector and to give examples and there are groups of organic farmers also i talked this year um, they try to go for a more collective approach like you told it's um not account per ton, uh, per plot, and so on, but really um, to pay for um, mitigation, collective mitigation actions, which are improving sustainability of agriculture as more as a process. And, and not, to, not to say there's a specific company offsetting and getting to, to zero emissions. I just, uh, thanks a lot for the comment. Uh, and I just would like to give some some data of the experience that I that I've had uh, in Brazil recently with a study that we ran at the Bioeconomy Observatory, which I think confirms the preoccupation of the participant. So we looked at the what we call the reality and practice of the carbon market in Brazil, and we tried to understand how many projects have actually been created and registered in the country where they are located who is selling the credits, according to which methodology, who is buying, how much they're paying, and who are the intermediaries. And one of the conclusions that we've reached for, which I found quite surprising, is how limited this market in practice is. Mm -hmm. So there are very, very few participants, in general, not more than five developers, uh, uh, basically Vera, the international certifier, is responsible for 93% of the registrations of the credits in Brazil. The majority of these credits uh, are credits generated according to one methodology, which has to do with forest protection. And some of these developers charge 50% of the value of the credit once it is sold for the development of the project. So um, it becomes a weird kind of market setting in which the intermediary gets half or more of the profit. And then one of the consequences of this obviously is a kind of skepticism on the part of the property owners themselves and uh, some criticism as well. But then what do you do vis-a-vis -vis that situation? One answer would be to say, stop all carbon market in the country and carbon farming in particular, including credits that go for the protection of the forest. An alternative would be, let's think of new ways to regulate and organize this market so that it can stimulate competition. And considering that Brazil is a relatively large country with a relatively sophisticated agricultural sector and economy and consumer market, maybe we would have the power to use this national demand to foster a kind of competition. So let's say to open the market from inside so that there are new players, new institutions that would work according to regulated principles and settings so they can monitor it more properly. And by also having some kind of competition also diminish this dependence of the property owner on the position of very few foreign intermediaries. Thank you, Daniel. Um, I would like to to finish in time, it has been a long day. Um, I will do the following. I will read to you two questions that have still come up in the chat, but I will actually ask you to give me uh, each of the panelists, and maybe in the same sequence as you're sitting there, Lini again last, um, to answer one question. Uh, 
what actions are needed and by who to make sustainable carbon farming a reality for both small and large scale farmers. And I'm deliberately not um, uh, including the, the, the carbon market here. You will give us the answer whether you think it can be the solution or not. Um, but that's sort of the question I'd like you to maybe make a short statement on. Um, and uh, now I read to you the two questions. Maybe you can answer them in passing. Uh, Sebastian Meyer wants to know, uh, what about fertilizer related uh, greenhouse gas emissions, um, which should be reduced through regenerative agriculture and much higher, uh, and are much higher than carbon removed in soil and plant material? Uh, the second question by Yusuf, who we know already, can peatland management and respective policies in Germany be a role model for carbon farming in general? So I assume that's a question to uh, Bernhard. Uh, for instance, instance, similar risk for stability, long longevity of carbon sequestrate and considering once peatland re-wetting is not maintained, soil carbon is largely lost. So a question on uh, fertilizer based emissions and the question on peatlands and the main question, what next? How do we move ahead? Sorry, Bernhard, you are the first. Um, so you have the least time to think about your answer. Yeah. <laughs> I, I would like to add one aspect. Uh, uh, if you answer, and I, I uh, Miss Wallenberg, I put you into the German uh, 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 action. Please uh, have one one sentence for the Brazilians and the Brazilians for the Germans. What uh, what are the needs and what are they? Yeah. Uh, uh, great. Um, uh, I start with the peatland. Uh, I would say uh, we are still seeking for role models. It's not out there because we are doing projects instead of overall land use planning. Um, and we are right at the beginning and we try to have an action plan together with the regions. Uh, it was announced in uh, 2014 um, and we came up in Germany um, in 2021. It, take, it took only to, to write a paper of five, five pages uh, seven years, uh, showing that it's really difficult uh, to get to land use policies, uh, especially in a densely populated um, country. Um, so um, we have to have um, a common understanding what land use policies really mean. And that's also to, to talk to so many actors and uh, keeping on board so many um, expectations and needs also. Um, so no final solution, no easy role model, I'm sorry. Um, about fertilizer. Um, I talked um, as well as a kind of farmer's fair um, with Yara, which is the largest nitrogen producer. And they said that they will turn very soon back to what they did before using natural gas um, for nitrogen fertilizer production. That's uh, using uh, hydrogen from uh, water power, uh, wind and solar energy. That's almost zero um, emission nitrogen fertilizer. They will provide provisions to drive down also uh, nitrous oxide emissions um, from using those fertilizers as they can. So to, to really look on the chain, that's a plan, that's a big player. Um, and this technology will spread, I'm sure, when, it's, um, when uh, fossils are expensive enough, I, I would say, um, uh, then this um, solutions will um, uh, really be more important. And that has to do with pricing, <laughs> pricing what's emitting you now to, to give way uh, to, to solutions. And that could be really a game shifter. And that's not um, fertilizing less, but uh, fertilizing in a wise way, uh, because it's that's on food security. It's not only on, on going into the extensification way, which is needed for biodiversity and some environmental issues where it's needed, but not on any productive area we have. Um, so uh, uh, what action is needed and by whom in the middle is really the farmer in self-interest to keep uh, um, the soils um, fertile is in the self-interest of land users. Um, so um, the uh, other parts, scientists, um, advisory services policy should make the way free in a way and put the incentives right. But what we need all those actors and also as innovators, I have to say they had they it, it would be the wrong picture to have them as fulfiller of a big plan. Now they had other generators of the new ideas uh, how to solve all those uh, challenges. Um, and uh, as a 
a message to Brazil. Um, we are uh, trying to cooperate in the Global Research Alliance on Greenhouse Gas Emissions from Agriculture um, because we want to have a continuous networking on those issues because it's very important to have an international learning space. And we try also to get more governance issues into it without without politicizing it too much because it's a scientific um, network and we of course we want to really uh, keep it a, a scientific network but uh, on that uh, in, on that um, ground we would really cooperate because international cooperation matters thank you on your closing question my speciality is carbon markets, not agriculture. So I only have a very uh, general response here. And that is looked at from the outside as it is. To me, it seems uh, carbon farming is a is a sideshow in agriculture. It's a side uh, track. And what is really needed is uh, systemic change in, in agriculture. So uh, a, a direction, I would like to see a direction whereby carbon farming is not a niche preoccupation in agriculture. What needs to be done? So uh, I've stressed, and my colleagues also from Brazil have stressed over, over the day and in the previous questions, the legal challenge to regulate the market and the scientific challenge to develop a set of tropical uh, uh, tailored methodologies that are actually adjusted to the reality of different countries beginning uh, in our case in Brazil. Uh, I would just add here that we are actually privileged to have in the country a scientific research institution as Embrapa, who is probably the most respected and well-known internationally scientific institution that exists in Brazil. Uh, and I know that they are currently leading very important projects to expand this frontier of knowledge. And that gives me hope. Um, and I would add a final point, which is, Brazil is obviously a very, very large country. And we don't have just one specific kind of agriculture. We have some. We don't have just one specific kind of environmental zone. We have some. And we might need then responses that are particular and according to the different regions. And then the question of scale is absolutely essential for any kind of sustainability project to effectively work in Brazil. How do you reach scale? And I do see the special role that could be played by a cooperativism in the country. Brazil has a very powerful network of cooperatives of all kinds, small, medium uh, farmers, large farmers. Uh, cooperatives are very closely connected to the history of the development of techniques and the assimilation of uh, uh, technology and innovation. And I do think that as they embrace the sustainability agenda and they are quickly moving in that direction, then uh, we might have a, a good chance of speeding up this process of improving uh, the quality, but also the productivity of the Brazilian agriculture so that can reconcile uh, economic growth with, with sustainability. And for my colleagues in the German side, I actually just would like very much to thank you. I learned a lot. Um, and I, I hope you both have the chance to visit us in Brazil at some point soon. And we can continue this exchange in our territory this time. Thanks a lot. Well, um, I would like to connect this question with the one you made before about uh, the quality of the credits, just uh, real quick. But uh, just don't, uh, I, I can't, uh, don't take the opportunity to <laughs> reinforce that I represent here a coalition that is composed of more than 330 organizations in Brazil from the private sector, financial sector, civil society organizations, and the academia. And, um, all of these organizations all together, uh, they uh, defend four main pillars uh, for the carbon markets to operate in a way that it can contribute to the environmental integrity of the global climate system. And some of them uh, was mentioned before by 
Sabine, right? <laughs> and uh, we we're talking about uh, MRV, and so we have to guarantee this this credit quality is guaranteed that we mitigate risks um, of leakage of um, making something wrong and double counting or something like this. But we also have to uh, keep in mind uh, the additionality. So we have to keep in mind that carbon markets um, are, are helping us to decarbonize the economy and implement the indices and uh, so on. And we also have to uh, keep in mind uh, social and environmental safeguards uh, to take into consideration the decision of those who are uh, usually generating the results and to have a robust uh, governance. So it, it all have to um, advance uh, all together because it's uh, very important. And uh, I'm saying that because we're looking at carbon farming and carbon markets as part of the climate solution. And now uh, getting to the final question and um, about who we have to engage in this uh, mission of uh, carbon farming and carbon markets. As all, all the uh, climate uh, issues, I think we have to collaborate. Uh, yeah, here you go. So we need producers to uh, broadly adopt low carbon practices and to being, be aware of uh, the uh, the role that agriculture sector uh, has to climate change mitigation adaptation. We need governments to take action to implement policies to um, um, align their policies just to a sustainable uh, land use. We need civil society to qualify the debates to promote dialogue among sectors and to put pressure on decision makers. And we need scientists to exchange knowledge and uh, to upscale these technologies that we are uh, talking about, about these methods. And we also need the private sector, as Edu uh, showed us uh, sooner, uh, earlier this afternoon. We need the private sector to understand they, uh, they're crucial for uh, climate solutions and to invest in um, neutrality transition. And finally, and getting to uh, Ingo's uh, question, we need uh, international cooperation just to be aware that we are living in a climate emergency, so we have to work together, we have to uh, keep in mind ambition in negotiations, so um, I would like to say to my German colleagues here that, uh, okay, we have a homework to do in Brazil, we have to combat illegalities, it's uh, uh, very bad over there, the illegal activities, it's um, uh, getting down our reputation and things like this, but we also have to implement these economic instruments. And so if we do this call of, uh, to our colleagues here in German, so let's work together and let's do it in, um, from a climate justice perspective. So that's it. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Thank you, Laura. Uh, Ladislaw, you have the final word now because uh, Lini has had to leave us for another meeting. So, big responsibility with you now. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, thank you for the opportunity. I believe that is um, certainly you are dealing with a so critical aspect from mankind. Uh, climate change is one of them, is, is affecting, it will affect uh, everybody. Uh, some of our colleagues, like Professor Wu Melung, talked about the flooding recently in this region. That to something is next, not, not, not unexpected. And uh, you have several uh, situations in our country, in everywhere. So, uh, in my point of view, uh, you, as a, a mankind, you must address this challenge. If you can do it together, this is the chance to uh, get better answer, you'll be bigger. And uh, also something that uh, uh, Professor Joaquim Van Brau mentioned is the question related with food security, agriculture production. This, there is a, several challenges is, and agriculture certainly is one of most, potentially most affected by climate change. So you must conciliate this agenda and to work in a win, win agenda globally. So my point of view, you have important opportunity, you are making important effort. 
I agree completely with Daniel told about the effort that was made in advance about scientific possibilities. You can work together. We have a lot to, to learn from our soil, for our organic mineral interaction, to, to see closer about the modeling, about several life cycle assessment, several points that you certainly working together, you can go further and then you could have better answer for human, mankind. This is the, the, the point. So I'm dealing here with our interest. And the, for the farmers, they are together as they have a personal responsibility, but also the society has responsibility with these uh, farmers. You have in Brazil, you talk all the time that you have larger farmers, everything is moving, exportation. I also have the majority of our farmers are small farmer holders which is immense difficult. The poverty in rural area is one of the largest in the country. This is another possibility. I just use the boss of the Brazilian Farmers Association to explain that there is a policy around, and it was very discussing with you how we can find some way to follow up with the spirit of Brazil's transfers and work together in this country. Well, I'm, I'm not prepared for that, uh, but uh, I, I want to make another speech. I want to thank uh, the BNL, uh, which is uh, uh, organizing the, the policy dialogue, not only with Brazil, but with a lot of other countries. Uh, this was a very fine debate because uh, we, we saw different views, and uh, I, I would very much hope that uh, we continue that uh, that dialogue, that, that exchange of knowledge in the, in, in the spirit that we have seen here. Uh, thank you very much for, for uh, being here, for participating. Thank you very much for all of you here in the room, and thank you very much for whoever is, uh, is uh, assisting here. Uh, thank you very much. <laughs>